Hey guys, thank you for joining me today. My name is Dr. Tom LeHue, and I'm going to be joined today with a guest named Baruch. He is a, a Jewish rabbi, retired, and works now using the Enneagram as a tool for coaching, for counseling, and uh, for speaking. And I'm excited to have him on today uh, as a guest. And just before we get to that interview, I just want to remind you that in the description below is a link to my website, tomlahue.com. I do Enneagram coaching, relationship coaching. Also, I have a lot of different courses available if you're interested in learning how to do Enneagram coaching, or uh, maybe you need some assistance in your relationship, or uh, maybe you just need something to help you get back into the swing of things and get back into the game of life. And I have a course called Great Life, and also one called the 10 Day Challenge that would be great at helping you get motivated and figuring out like you know what you need to get uh, excited about life once again. Also, if you go to my website and just enter your email address and join my Enneagram community, I have a free gift for you, a free download of a mini course called Know Your Why. So thank you for joining me today, and thanks again for my patrons. I really appreciate your support. So let's get to the interview. Okay, welcome, guys. Um, I've got a guest today named Baruch uh, Halevi. He goes by B, and uh, Baruch um, I'm glad to have you on my channel, and um, you also are a fellow Enneagram person. Tell me a, a little bit about uh, yourself. Tell me about your Enneagram type and maybe how you came across the Enneagram and, and what you do. Absolutely. Well, I'm just honored to be on your uh, to be on your show. I've watched so many YouTube videos and listened to your podcast for a long time and just really appreciate the pioneering work you've done. That's why I reached out to you and, um, again, just great honor to be here. So thank you. Um, I am, I, my language, and I'll tell you why I react, I respond like an Enneagram eight, the challenger, at least that's what I call it. Do you call it the challenger? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my wife calls it the eight hole, but, um, the, <laughs> I've heard that <laughs> the challenger. Um, right. and so, um, and my, my instinct is, uh, sexual or one-to-one. -one, so probably the most provocative type, uh, on the Enneagram. Um, and I have seen myself in many ways as a disruptor of all kinds of things because I think there's a lot of um, a lot of divinity, a lot of spirituality, a lot of meaning that comes out of disrupting status quo. And so I've been disruptive since I was a little kid, and I learned how to channel it. I hope, or at least I'm learning. I'm learning how to channel it in more constructive and productive ways. For about um, 20 years, uh, I was, I still am a rabbi, so I'm an ordained conservative rabbi, and um, so I, I did that as long as I could, but it was not so easy to color inside the lines as a sexual eight on the pulpit. Um, so I did that, and then I pursued my passions of counseling, of coaching, and I got a doctoral degree in pastoral counseling. And then I focused in on my true mentor and teacher in this lifetime. His name is Viktor Frankl, um, pretty well known for one of his books, Man's Search for Meaning, but father of logotherapy. It's a school of psychotherapy that says meaning and spirituality must be at the center um, on our journey of wholeness and healing. And so years ago, I got trained as a logotherapist. And that really um, brought together my work around the Enneagram. So I started exploring the Enneagram 30 years ago, but I studied it through Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Uh, it was introduced to me in that vein, a lot of overlap. And then what I started to find was my energy, my interest was gravitating more towards Enneagram than Kabbalah, though I still really hold that near and dear to my heart. And what I found with the Enneagram was it's just an amazing platform, an amazing system to live out these other things that I was exploring, you know, my rabbi piece, spirituality, my Viktor Frankl piece and meaning. And then how do you live that out in your day to day life? Well, that's when the Enneagram became a, a roadmap for me. And so now I spend my days counseling, coaching and teaching around bringing spirituality, meaning, purpose into people's lives using the Enneagram as that platform. Great. Okay. Um, and do you find that people are open to this kind of work? Extremely open. I would say that one of the reasons why I left the organized religion, um, you know, that I was participating in is 
A, because I am an Enneagram 8, and that's that disruptive piece, and I couldn't really express myself fully and freely. I, I, I tend to drop the F-bomb. I'm really, I'm trying not to, but it didn't go over so well when you're on the pulpit. So, you know, finding a context that I felt comfortable in, and they felt comfortable with me. And one of the things I'm seeing, you're seeing this, we're all seeing this, is the rise of the spiritual, not religious the unchurched, the unsynagogued, the majority of people out there who still need the tools, the resources, the systems that religion once provided, the Enneagram does that in a much more, I think, subtle and secular way, but doing the same thing. And people are hungry for it. They need it. They know they need it. And when it comes to them in the form of the Enneagram, I have found them much more receptive than trying to get them to buy into and by their standards, an antiquated religious tradition. Well, yeah, because, you know, people might just immediately say, well, I'm not Jewish or I'm not Christian. So I guess our conversation's over, or I guess you're going to try to convert me. And <laughs> this allows us to have spiritual natured conversations without necessarily um, uh, pushing people you know, what I found is people are willing to talk about their personality. And as soon as we start to talk about your personality type, you know, we're talking about things beneath the surface. You know, we're talking about soul things like the motivations and sins that drive our behaviors. And uh, this has been my experience as well. I've heard that throughout your podcast. You have a very spiritual thread that's usually non-sectarian, non-religious. I, I mean, I've heard Christianity come up uh, here and there, but it's it's a universal message, as is Christianity, as is Judaism, as is all these isms. The challenge is, is that we are, you know, I, as I always said, when somebody would come to me as a rabbi and they had a bad Hebrew school education, I'd always say I'd rather them have no education than a bad education, because starting from scratch is a lot easier than starting from in the hole. Yeah. And that's, you say the word sin and half the people have gone, uh oh. But if you say passion, they say, huh, what's that? Well, they're the same thing with a different word to present them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that maybe I don't have as good a respect for how icky the words Sunday school or, <laughs> or Christian uh, might be might be to or how off-putting it might be to people who either had a bad experience in a church or a synagogue um or you know um or just have a perception a negative perception because they bumped into some ugly versions of christians <laughs> and they're religion, out there yeah religion in general um but you know as i always say a teacher of mine um once said you know, divorce or marriage done bad leads to divorce. And very few people say, well, I'm not going to get married because my parents were divorced. But religion done bad ends up as I'm not going to do religion. As opposed to the antidote to bad religion is good religion or bad marriage is good marriage. And so I don't really care. To me, it's semantics. If we want to deliver it through this universal platform called the Enneagram, great. I just care that the message gets delivered. Because, you know, I come from the, the Jewish tradition, obviously, and there's no God. There's no G-O-D. Try and find G-O-D anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. It doesn't exist. There's the Hebrew names for God, and there were 72 of them in the Bible, according to the mystics. Why? Because God doesn't have a name. So let's not get hung up on what we call this oneness. Let's just get into that oneness. I feel like the Enneagram allows me to get to that conversation a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah, you can find some commonalities uh, with people and um, get beneath some of the defensive structures or actually expose the defensive structures that each type has and see the blind spots. And then when we see those blind spots, hopefully we can, um, you know, become aware of them and maybe learn to move past some of them. Now, now, with that said, um, I do think one of the dangers of the Enneagram is the same danger I see in organized religion, which is turning something that's vibrant or um, energy into something that's static, right? That is the downfall. That's idolatry, according to Kabbalah, is to make the one, right, the God, whatever you want to call God, into a fixed image, into a fixed entity. That's idolatry. 
And, and I see the same thing that does happen in the Enneagram world where it becomes a box and you're in the box and this is who you are and this is what you are. And to me, that's no different than bad religion. That's bad Enneagram. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'm amazed when I actually, because when I, when I do videos and read and watch videos and learn, but then when I actually really watch people that are a specific type, I'm often surprised. Like I see a one doing the wrong thing, or I see an eight being very compassionate or even being allowing themselves to be manipulated by other people or a nine being very harsh. And you think, okay, the Enneagram is really helpful at some basic structures, but at the end of the day, people are unique and people come in all different versions of eight and all different versions of nine. And you know, um, as, as well as I do, we don't have a number. We have all nine of these. These are fundamental energy patterns in the universe. And, and I would argue in Kabbalah, there's a thing called the tree of life. Maybe you've seen it. It's got all these circles. There's 10 of them. And, and somebody said, you know, how, that's where the Enneagram and Kabbalah break down because there's 10, there's nine, there's not. There's 10 on the Enneagram. The circle is the 10th, right? We are, we are all trying to get back to that oneness. We live in a world of brokenness. And so we have our go-to strategy, but it's not all of who I am. And, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've rank ordered these as, as survival tactics. Yeah. So I have to learn how to access all of them and not just rely on one tactic, one strategy. Yeah. I always think of it as like going to a, a, a dinner with eight other types and asking them, how do you see the world? Like what's important to you? And listening to the wisdom each of each of the other eight types and saying, you know, I know I'm not a one, but a, lo a little bit of that would probably help me out if I could get a little more of that way of thinking incorporated into the way I interact and doing that with every type. Well, I thought you're going to go a different direction and say it's like going to a dinner party and figuring out who you don't want to sit next to, right? <laughs> well, well, I'm sit next to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, next to <laughs> maybe our perspectives are a little different being a seven versus an eight. No, but I think that that's partially, you know, what this is about is like figuring out what pieces of me have I rejected? Do I push away versus the ones that I go to? I was just having a conversation with somebody about instinct and they said, well, what really makes an eight and eight? I said, I think in my limited, you know, experience is I overdo instinct. I over rely on it and I never go wrong with ready, aim, fire, but half my life is ready, fire, aim. And so I have to learn how to defy, you know, I, that's why I call my program Defy Your Number. It comes from Frankel's work of nice. within you is the defiant power of the human spirit. You're not a number. Um, I, wear, I wear a tattoo on my arm that says 119104. And that was Viktor Frankl's Holocaust number. He was a survivor. And he was reduced by Nazis to a number right? He was less than human. That's how they eradicated 6 million. You can't, you can't murder 6 million people. You can, you can extinguish 6 million numbers because they're less than human. And I feel like that's what the Enneagram can become is this reductionistic, make us smaller, make us less than, and then we can reject that piece of ourselves. And so our work is to defy that. And I work very hard to defy my Enneagram eight, but when I'm in fear, when I'm unconscious, I, I look like an eight. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I, I always say like learning to push back on the impulses and compulsions when when they're not really working for you. It, it, you get to where I think it was uh, might have been uh, Alice Freiling who talked in her book Mirror for the Soul, where she talked about um, the roommate, like the, the Enneagram type is like a roommate that that promises us uh, to help our experience. But then, you know, like any roommate, after maybe three months, we start to get annoyed <laughs> with the constant chatter of this roommate. And and maybe we trust these impulses and compulsions a little too much. They become so familiar. But learning to realize, like, this impulse is a seven impulse or an eight impulse. It works for me much of the time. But it doesn't always work for me. And there are times when I need to know the difference and then push back on these impulses and compulsions. 
Yeah. And like at that dinner table analogy, right? We end up sitting around with people oftentimes who are yes men or yes women or echo chambers. And, you know, like it says in the Hebrew Bible is, you know, when Adam's lonely, God makes for Adam a, an ezer connecto in Hebrew. A, somebody, didn't, it's always translated as help me, which like nobody knows what that means. Ezer means to nurture and connecto means to be a, you know, challenge, to be an eight, right? And so we need that challenge, but we end up going to what's easy. I do. I go end up going to those pieces of me that are just easy. I'll just give myself over and be an eight versus I need to be like a nine here. That, that's yeah. actually. That takes effort. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Learn, I, and I, well, and I would say, yeah, like learning to lean into that. And I, I find that, that, you know, the numbers you're connected to, um, like as an eight, it would be seven, nine, uh, two and five, like, like a good place to start with people is to think about what those types would say to you. And, this this gets particularly helpful when you think about your less dominant wing mm -hmm. and the number you integrate to. Like in your case, if you put a nine and a two together and you said, what advice would you give Baruch? What how would you how would you steer him a little bit differently? That becomes an excellent source of inspiration for a discussion, at least. Totally. You know, like even when you say that, I think nine and two, my work with nine, because I have a lot of nine and two clients, is to teach them or help them or empower them how to say no and feel good about it. No. Boundaries. No. For an eight, that's like second nature to me, right? I got to learn how to say yes. Oh. Right. Right. Yeah. Or to say, it's fine. It's, it's okay. Fine. I don't Go need to floor. fight it. Yeah. Right. Peace. Right. Exactly. Yeah, but well, I, love, I love listening to you because you def you've defied that seven. Like I don't think you know. Oh, Tom's a seven. I, I can't put you in that box because even I mean, before we began, I said you don't even feel to me you dress like a seven. You know, I don't know too many sevens who wear black t shirts, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's not bright enough and hopeful enough and optimistic enough. So I feel like you've. I mean, I know your instinct. You said is a social seven, right? Counter type, but still, I can feel that work that you've done on yourself. I imagine your 20 year old self looked very different than this version. Yeah. Well, I'll feel, I'll feel the seven impulse. And there are times when I just let it go and I just act on it because I feel like, okay, this is a good time to be ridiculous or a good time to be lighthearted or to raise the energy. But then there's other times when I've, you know, I've had to learn the hard way, like, okay, it's funny, but maybe it's hurtful. <laughs> So <laughs> I don't want to upset the people around me. <laughs> I'm still learning that lesson. Yeah, her hurtful humor is up in that seven eight you know corner yeah. right up there. It's yeah, true. right. Okay, so tell me about the work that you do with people. You do coaching. Um, you, you also do some speaking and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I'm a, you know my primary identity these days is a logo therapist. Again, logos means meaning. So meaning centered psychotherapy. So I do a lot of, um, you know, more therapeutic counseling work, but I've, I've merged into the, the Enneagram world. So I do see myself now just as much as a, a coach bringing the Enneagram together with um, meaning centered principles. And so really using those two things, coaching individuals, I, I've been doing a lot more executive coaching. Um, we talked in a previous conversation about the corporate space is really ready for this system, I think, in ways that they probably weren't 10 years ago. And I'm having interesting quasi-spiritual conversations in corporate settings, which you know, is somewhat unheard of. So it's, you know, it's like a ministry of sorts in a in an environment that has resisted that, if not been outright against it up until this point in time. Yeah. Right. Do you think in this in this quest for meaning, do you think the Enneagram can be helpful in helping people um sort out the purpose of their life? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, Viktor Frankl's philosophy rests upon the Nietzsche's quote, if you have your why, you can endure a, your how. He who has a why can endure any how. You got to know your why. And when I ask uh, companies 
about their why. They're very good at telling me their why. You know, Nike, just do it, whatever. It's it's very succinct and clear. And then I ask these same men and women, what's your what's your why? And they look at me with this like blank stare. Like, what do you mean, what's my why? I just told you the company's why, right? But you're not the company. What's your why? And when you ask people this, you know, I'm 51 years old. Like I turn people, my contemporaries, our contemporaries, and they, they've never been asked this question so pointed. And then we begin this journey of your why based on the Enneagram, because I do believe it really presents to us our fundamental core why from an energetic perspective, from a big picture. You know, now it's up to Tom to nuance it and make it your own. But my why, for instance, has always been to be a disruptor of the status quo. That's the eight MO, challenge authority kind of a thing. So that's part and parcel of my why. So to answer your question, I haven't met too many people who, when we get to their core Enneagram type, haven't said, yeah, my why is bound up in that somehow, somewhere. Right, right. Whether they realize it or not. And I always think like even whatever job you have, whether you're working at a university or police department or school system or, you know, whatever it is, hospital, um, you have a certain tendency to show up in this in a similar way in whatever job it is because of your passion or your Enneagram type. It helps us see, you know, you tend to bring this set of perspective and gifts with you wherever you go, whether you realize it or not. And to me, the greatest tragedy in life is to deny that, right? It's to be somebody else for, you know, someone else. And here's an example. I've ended up working with a bunch of social twos, but twos, not the typical two, but still twos, the helper relationship. They happen to be in corporate settings. They also happen to be all men. And they have been like fish out of water their entire careers. They're super successful, but they've had to, they've, they've believed they had to push that piece of themselves to the side to be more three-ish, to be more corporate. And what we've been working on is, can you get back to the corporate setting on your terms and nurture and be a mentor and be relational? And what's happened is they've done, they've stopped compartmentalizing their lives. And as a result, they're happier, they're, they're more authentic, people are responding to them better because they're not trying to be a different number. Yeah, I love it. I get chills just thinking about that. Um, yeah, because I remember when I first started to learn about the Enneagram and, you know, from a pastoral perspective, sevens often are good communicators and likable folks, you know, but when I think about pastors, I think, nines and ones and threes and you know fives maybe the professors and i had to just realize like okay i am who i am and i know the enneagram doesn't limit you it shows you how you sort of limit yourself but mm -hmm. i i just remember the day when i said okay i i'm letting it go i am not a three i never will be a three i can learn a lot of principles from threes and a lot of that i should incorporate into the way i live out and serve and work but i am a seven i just am <laughs> i have to be okay with that and i'm just going to try to focus on being the best seven i can be rather than berating myself that i'm not more like a one or more like a three true i mean it's a it's a coming out of the Enneagram closet, right? Like, this is who I am. Like, and I, I have to be this way. There's there's a teaching um, in the in the Kabbalistic tradition about a guy named Zusha, a famous teaching, who's, you know, standing in front of God and ultimate, or no, he's worried about the day he has to stand in front of God. And all the students say, what are you so worried about? You're a great man. You're, and he says, I'm not worried that they're not going to, that God's going to ask me, why weren't you more like Moses? Or I'm not going to, I'm not worried that God's going to ask me, why weren't you more like King David? I'm going to, I'm worried that God's going to ask me, why weren't you more like Zusha? Why weren't you more like you? And to me, that's the judgment day. Like we're going to have to stand whatever that end point is and answer for why didn't you live your life, your truth, your purpose? Because that's the work. I mean, I know you do too. You coach a ton of people. This is the work. Every conversation is around this issue. How do I live my meaning, my purpose, my truth? Period. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so many times I think the thing that stops us, and I'm sure as an eight, you see this even more than maybe I do, is like fear or insecurities. We hesitate, we we compare with others, and that fear keeps us from maybe fully realizing all that we could be in life. Oh, at least that's why it's the number one commandment in the Bible. I'll tear it up. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not. Why? You only command things because they need to be commanded, right? It's it's a, it's a daily battle to, to, to not end up succumbing to that fear, to succumbing to my Enneagram type. You know, Franklin says there's only two ways to be in the world. Either you're in reaction or response. Reaction is unconscious. It's it's in fear. Response, he says, responsible, response able, able to choose your response. And that's where the Enneagram helps me have a roadmap for I'm in fear. I'm in reaction. What are my pathways out? Right. And that's wings and lines and instincts and all these strategies and tools. The system is just so practical. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so a little bit off subject. What would you say to the uh, the naysayer, the critic out there that um, says, what is this idiot Graham thing? What is this? Uh, you know, I think we need to just get uh, away from these things. And, uh, you know, you're trying to put people in boxes. And this is just like Myers-Briggs and DISC. And, you know, I think that... Uh, um, there's no place for this. What would you say to the real stubborn person who just doesn't see the value in anything like this? Look, we all need roadmaps. I, you know, like we we take vacations now and you no longer need a roadmap because you got this little handheld device and it's saved so many marriages. I always think, you know, my wife and I don't argue anymore over like the, the directions because I just plug in and it gives me choices. And I think that that's why the Enneagram is so powerful. It doesn't say, this is the way. You know, if you look at, with all due respect, Taoism um, and Judaism and Christianity, and is they all have this, the way. You know, in Judaism called halakha, and Tao literally means the way. You know, Judaism, or Christ, uh, Christ called himself, you know, via the, the way. And those are great if they work for people. But I think a lot of people are a little bit turned off this theoretical person you're talking about, this is the way. And I would argue that the Enneagram is not saying that at all. In fact, it's saying the opposite. If you don't have a roadmap, if you don't have this new version of a roadmap in your hand, you're going to end up going the way you've always gone, right? The same way. And a teacher of mine once said, a routine is a rut and a rut is a grave with both ends knocked out. And that's, you just live in this rut. And the Enneagram is actually a way out of the rut. And it doesn't tell you the way, it shows you ways. And now you have choice. And I haven't met anybody who doesn't want choice. I was just at Starbucks, <laughs> the person in front of me, like I wanted to shoot. They got like a venti triple half calf soy latte with two Splendas and extra foam and extra hot. And I'm just sitting there going, that's choice gone, like wrong, way off the deep end. But like, what about some clear cut choices in our day to day living so we don't end up in that rut? Yeah. Wow. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> I, he didn't stick around long enough, probably, to hear that. <laughs> You're listening. Right. Right. Um, and I, and I, and as a seven, I appreciate that you know, options or choices, because until you see the plays that you're always running you, and you don't realize like, oh, other people do this differently or other people value other things more than the stuff that I value. And I, now that I see the plays that I'm running and there's a hundred other plays that I could run, you know, I always say in coaching, when, I, when I'm doing like, when we're talking to students going through the coaching program, I always say, you want to ask yourself when you're talking to somebody, what is the problem? Like, what is the problem they're, they're upset about? You know, it might be that their kid's not making it in life and they're worried about them or that they're not sure whether to take this job or that job or their relationship, their marriage isn't doing well. What is the problem? And then the second question is, why does this problem feel like a problem to this person? Because there's other people that maybe have that same problem that 
they just roll with it or they solve it or they work through it or they just ignore it. But sometimes the Enneagram, I think, helps us to see sometimes what's going to feel like a problem to you and why it feels like a problem. And then it'll show you sort of the natural impulsive ways you try to solve your problems. And then it will also start to suggest, you know, there's there's eight other different perspectives out there that might solve that problem very differently or think differently about the problem than you do. Totally. And that's why, you know, people all the time will give me some version of what that theoretical guy, you know, you challenged me with gives me, which is, doesn't it reduce people to a number? Like, isn't, aren't you doing exactly the opposite? You know, you, you don't want to reduce anybody. You got this tattoo, never again, the Holocaust. I won't be a part of anything that turns somebody into a number. Aren't you doing that very thing, B? The exact opposite, because it's um, John Got was it John Gottman who wrote yes. the love languages? Oh, yeah. uh, Gary Chapman. Yeah. So love languages. I, until that book came along, I didn't even think about there are different ways that people experience love. I just assume, you know, like the world thinks and moves like me. Now I can see people, you know, right? I can, I think, it, which is to me is the most divine act of a human being is to bear witness to another human being's journey, but not just to look, to see them. And if I know you're a nine, I can see you through your love language, speak in your language, deal with your issues and challenges that I as a nine, eight don't have a lot of those, but this isn't about me. And now I can see you. And so it, it actually does the opposite. I, I think you experience the same thing. It allows me to have more empathy for people. Yeah. Yeah, it's like every one of us speaks with an accent. We don't hear it ourselves because it's just the way we speak. But when we start to pick up other people's accent, like they're they're living in this nine world and they have a nine accent, how can I slow down to fully interpret what they're saying and then speak to them in a way? Let me give you an example of this. Uh, my wife is a two, okay? And uh yesterday i took a couple of my kids down to disney world because we live just you know right around the corner from disney world and so we stopped in just for a couple of hours at magic kingdom to see the fall decorations whatever so <laughs> we went and saw the fall decorations and rode a couple of rides and the very first thing i thought was i need to take a picture of myself with the kids a selfie with the fall decorations behind us and send that to my wife like as soon as we get into the park send that to my wife now if i was the one at home i wouldn't necessarily care if my wife sent a selfie with the kids to me but i realize she's a two she wants to feel connected she wants to feel like you know that that she matters and we think about her and we care about her enough to just be thoughtful for a second. Now she wouldn't be mad if I didn't, but it's it's knowing a person's, and I might have known that even before the Enneagram, just being married to her, but uh, it really helps us in those kind of situations to just be a little bit more compassionate and thoughtful to each other. That's a great example. And you said, you know, she wouldn't have been mad if you didn't send it, which is like saying, you know, like I'm I, okay is fine. Like it's good enough. And if you if you want to go beyond good enough, you have to have that roadmap. And so I can't. I literally, I have a wife who's a four and a son who's a four. I got four kids, all four different enneagram types. My son who's a four gets into the car after school, and he just emotionally vomits all over the place. <laughs> and my eight reaction is, you know, essentially put your head outside the window and vomit out there. Because this is messy and gross. But what she has taught me and what the Enneagram has shown me is my job is to hold out a garbage can, you know, proverbial, nice. and let him get it all out and say, honey, is there anything else you want to share? Is there anything else? And he's done. And he likes me now more. You know, he wants to be with me more because I see him. It's not what I want. It's what he needs. Yes. And same thing with your wife. And now our relationship is great where it used to be. Good. It was good. It was fine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I remember, you know, coaching a one parent with a four child and, you know, ones and eights could probably be a little bit wired in a similar way. When you think about if you've got a problem, 
solve it, overcome it, quit belly aching and just, you know, fix it, take care of it, move on. And sometimes when four is the speaking style of a four is lamenting <laughs> and they're not always looking for a solution. And as an eight or a one, you know, I remember this appointment, the, the one parent was frustrated because they kept giving their kids solutions and they weren't acting on them. They were just getting more and more frustrated. And you're exactly right. You know, the four in that case, the, the son really didn't want a solution as much as to be heard, understood, valued, cared about, you know, not minimized and diminished with easy solutions for mom. Totally. When, when, <laughs> when um, my wife, I told you, she's, you know, pushing my button, she'll call me the eight hole. And that's when I, you know, use that eight uh, not so funny humor and i'll say because she's a four i'll say oh for me for me, for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the lower side of that's when i yeah, yeah. don't do this at home folks don't do this at home. <laughs> um, right can I, can I flip the script on you and ask you yeah okay. sure um yeah so I, as i mentioned i've listened to so many of your or watched so many of your videos and i I hear this um, spiritual message, either explicit or implicit, and I, I would love to hear your take on uh, the role of spirituality in the 21st century with the Enneagram. Yeah. Well, again, I think sometimes people are more willing to talk about this kind of thing, personality and that. And, you know, as soon as we start that conversation, we're really talking about the soul. Um I think psychology is kind of a misnomer because literally in Greek, you know, it's the the knowledge of the soul. And yet a lot of psychology doesn't even believe in a soul. And and it it's not that it's not useful and helpful. It's just to get beneath the surface and behind the defense mechanisms. Um, the Enneagram is a great tool to expose and exposing doesn't feel good. I mean, you know, when you first learned about the Enneagram, it feels humiliating. Like, I don't know that I want everybody to know this about me. <laughs> Gluttony? No. Um, and, you know, anyway, so I I feel like it's a great tool to get that discussion going. And then, you know, if you were a Christian person or a Jewish person, if you so chose, you could easily have follow-up discussions about um, those deeper things from that worldview or from that perspective, but it wouldn't require that. I mean, secular people, um, even atheist people, I think would have no problem using a tool like this to uh, benefit themselves and others. Um, but um, many of the people I've talked to come from a Christian background, a Christian worldview. And even some of them, I think, you know, have, have found uh a new realized importance in systematic faith uh, mm -hmm. after after encountering the Enneagram. And that's always exciting uh, to see people, you know, once those, it's kind of like dominoes, you know, once that first domino gets pushed and people start moving in a spiritual way, there's no telling where it's going to take them. And for some, it may take them much further than others. So I grew up in Nebraska. All my friends are evangelical Christians. Growing up, I was the token Jew, um, so I'm very comfortable in you know that world. And at first, some of them were like, "You know, what's this devil worship?" Right? I saw that picture of it online, that Pentecost thing, or what? Not Pentecost. The uh, oh, whatever. pentagram. Yeah. Pentagram. I'm like, right. guys, this is from your tradition. Like, this thing probably grew out of a Christian mystic, you know, desert experience thousands of years ago. And they start the, you know, the defense mechanism will start to come down. They start, the interest starts to grow. But what I've seen is I have a lot of clients who are Christian. It actually strengthens their faith. I've seen only strengthening of faith, not a pitting the Enneagram against the church. Has that been your experience? Yeah. Well, we, you know, whatever our religious <clears throat> solutions are, um, we all have the same problems. You know, who are we? Where do we come from? What's the meaning of life? <clears throat> Where are we going? I mean, we everybody asks or should ask these deep philosophical questions. And it would change. Most people's lives would be forever changed if they would stop long enough to ask those questions. Just give it a week. You know, <laughs> I find people spend more time planning their vacation than they plan their you know, their spiritual life. And so just pausing long enough to say, who am I? 
where did I come from? What is the meaning of all this? Where are we headed? What's it all, what's it all for? Just those, you know, autumn kind of questions would could transform many people's lives and have transformed many people's lives. And I know you've seen this too. It's sticky, you know, whereas most Christians are Christian on Sunday, most Jews are Jewish on the high holy days. What happens the rest of the time? Like, what are you <laughs> using to embody these universal principles? And, and I see like my, my kid who's in college uses the Enneagram, albeit to meet girls, but nonetheless using the Enneagram. <laughs> Uh, but I was just counseling my mom, who's helping my stepfather transition to the next world using the Enneagram. He's a nine, she's a two. So she wants him to die on her terms, right? And and he wants to die, you know, as a nine. And like, can you use it to exit this world? Can you use it in parenting in this world? So to me, that is the most important thing is it's just sticky. I haven't found an area of life where it doesn't work. No. Yeah. Well, and once you see it, you know, I always think of those magic eye posters from the 90s in the mall where you would look at this blob of colors and then all of a sudden a dolphin would pop out. And Spencer's some people. Spencer's Gifts. I remember that place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some people. <laughs> well, I didn't go into Spencer's Gifts. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, you didn't. <laughs> would never go into Spencer's Gifts. <laughs> if I did, I'm not telling. <laughs> but anyway. I went in a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you some people would stare and stare and stare and they'd never see the dolphin, you know, it would never pop out. But once it does, and once it once that comes into focus, it's much like much like parables, like the meaning of parables. Uh, you know, you hear this story and it just sounds like a story, and then all of a sudden you realize, like Nathan told David, you're the man. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden this, the parable becomes powerful. And the Enneagram is like that. I think, you know, there are people who just on a surface level see it as another corporate tool to get the most productivity out of their employees, you know, or a church, you know, enamored with uh, a new something out of California or whatever. But if you if you stay long enough to see your type and to see um, the impulses, compulsions and how much of your life has been driven <laughs> and you see the dolphin, so to speak. Um, once you see this, it's, it's hard to unsee it. And, and now I find myself and my kids too, watching television shows. And, you know, we're all kind of like, that guy's a five, that lady's a three. Oh wait, no, she's a two wing three. <laughs> you know, you just, you just, and when my kids who are teenagers now, when they go visit, um, you know, friends or another church or something, youth group or something, they'll come home. And the first thing they'll say is, um, oh, I met this new girl. Uh, her name is this. And she's got to be a seven. It's the first thing they say. And that probably tells me more about that person than whether they're a boy or a girl or whether they're brown hair or blonde hair. Uh, all of that stuff is pretty irrelevant. So I was just um, in a corporate setting and using the Enneagram. And around the leadership table team, there were 10 people. Every single one of them had in their profile that they thought like a nine. In my system, I, I use the try type or the whole type. So act, think, feel. There wasn't one of them that didn't, lots of them were sevens. Sorry, I didn't say nine, sevens. Um, every single one thought like a seven. And what we talked about was, you know, diversity, social equity, all this stuff is surface and has its place, whatever, yes. But what about real inclusion, which is bringing some fives and sixes into the leadership team? Yeah. Because you have a glass ceiling in this company where fives and sixes are pushed away. They said, give me an example. I said, okay, how many of you around this table are comfortable with the end of this board meeting, we're making a decision, make the decision. Every single hand says, we do that. We act fast. Fives are not going to want to be a part of this conversation. They need to sleep on it. Sixes need to be challenged or to challenge the assumptions. There's no room for that in this company. You don't have diversity. It's a whole new yeah. way of looking at diversity. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, what I find in our culture is we we champion diversity of all people that think like me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but the Enneagram really shows us, you know, um, what 
diversity could look like. Baruch, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Is there, uh, tell us a little bit about your website or what people, if people want to know more about what you're doing or want to make an appointment with you, what should they do next? That's very generous of you. Thank you. Um, Defiant Spirit, defiantspirit.org is my website. Certainly jump over there, have um, some offerings, but I'd certainly go to Tom's mm -hmm. first because he's been my mentor in the Enneagram. And really thank you for being such a uh, pioneer in this space and bringing spirituality to the Enneagram. So thank you. But yeah, that's where they can find it. And then I've also started the Victor Frankel Meaning Academy, which um, you can go to Victor Frank, you can go to the meaningacademy.com, the meaningacademy.com, where we're teaching on the works of Victor Frankel. So those are my two passions and pursuits and uh, we'll just keep doing it. Nice. I've enjoyed having you on this, uh, uh, this video and look forward to, to uh, getting to know you better and seeing um, uh, your work in the future. Thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate it.